Education has been somewhat of a wild card the past few years. Between the pandemic, policy changes to curriculum, and educators leaving the field at a rapid pace, leading to a teacher shortage nationally. Now, teachers are often the unsung heroes in our community. That's why we're talking with local educators about what learning looks like today and their hopes for the future. We've heard it in the headlines the last few years. America's classrooms are battling through a shortage of educators. In fact, a report from the U.S. Government Accountability Office shows the nation lost 233,000 teachers between 2019 and 2021. That's 7% of the teaching population. The National Education Association is the nation's largest union representing nearly 3 million educators. It released a survey in 2022 showing that these massive staff shortages are leaving teachers increasingly burnt out, with 74% saying they've had to take on extra work. 55% said they're ready to leave the profession earlier than planned. While the numbers of educators in schools were showing negative trends before the COVID-19 pandemic, studies show its impacts have largely correlated with this teacher turnover and burnout. Today, schools are going to great lengths to keep educators in the classroom, in state-funded programs like Teach Michigan, teachers can earn an extra $35,000 if they agree to work at specific districts for the next three years. We're seeing this happen in schools in Kentwood and Grand Rapids. In Ottawa County, Holland Public Schools has one of the most unique incentives yet, helping teachers purchase homes. Holland, Michigan. It's a picturesque landscape housing everything from beaches to tulip gardens and award-winning breweries. It's been voted one of America's prettiest cities by Forbes magazine and ranks first in quality of life for Michigan small cities. For many, there's just one problem. My wife and I were looking at buying a house and frankly, the prices in Holland for like a starter house are very high. Ashlyn Ruffner Rowell is a teacher at Holland Public Schools. She moved to the city for work and like many educators, was thrown for a loop when the COVID-19 pandemic shuttered classroom doors. So I graduated and first started teaching in Hall in January of 2020. So I only got three months of like normal quote unquote teaching. As virtual learning ushered in an entirely new era of education, teachers' homes transformed into makeshift classrooms. For Refner Rowell, this meant teaching out of her apartment, but that would soon change. We're really at the beginning of what this teacher shortage and what this, how it will impact our schools. We're trying to stay out in front of it as much as possible, and making sure we're doing everything we can to keep take care of our teachers. Amid a crisis level teacher shortage, only exasperated by the pandemic, Holland Public Schools launched its Teachers Live Here program, which aims to not only retain educators, but boost morale and support, offering $25,000 towards purchasing a home. Honestly, I think it was the same thought that some of our teachers had when we first rolled this out. This is, this is too good to be true, and it's not. It's real. We started it in January, and eight teachers have already been significantly impacted by this um, moving forward. The program's funding is a mystery, only known by few HPF staff or partners. All that said is an anonymous donor wants to ensure Holland teachers have the ability to live where they serve. Teachers like Ashlyn, who want to be connected to their community. I realized like I do want to set my roots in Holland and it was a pretty easy process. Like they want teachers to apply for it. Right over there is my student, Leo. Down there is a freshman that just moved in and a middle schooler. And so I constantly see students like just walking by when something happens like in the neighborhood, like we get to talk about that. So that's one part of it is just like, I am a part of the physical community that my kids are in. Homes must be purchased within 15 miles of the HPS district boundaries. In order to qualify, applicants must have a minimum of one semester at HPS under their belt, be pre-approved for a traditional mortgage, and have an income below $102,800. The final catch? Educators must agree to teach at Holland Public Schools for an additional five years. 
the more that we can do to retain this new generation of teachers coming in and you know even some veteran teachers who still meet the criteria if we can retain them and, and provide stability for our kids and our, our schools it benefits everybody five of those have bought homes right in Holland and several of them can walk to their school which is what was envisioned when this program came to be is like how do we get teachers invested into our community to give back and then just to be able to retain good people who want to be here. The grant offers a unique answer to teacher retention, but also the ongoing wage gap between record high inflation rates and teaching salaries, which have remained relatively flat. And with limited school funds, many educators are throwing the money they do have back into their classrooms. I think it's 175 to buy resources like classroom stuff, but that doesn't nearly cover like I've probably have about $4,000 worth of books in my classroom that either comes out of pocket or from donors that I have to organize. A study by the Economic Policy Institute found when factoring in inflation, the average weekly wages of public school teachers decreased by $128 between 2021 and 2022. It also found, on average, teachers made around 26% less than other similarly educated professionals. I could not afford this house without this grant. It just wouldn't be possible on my salary. So I think it helps me feel more appreciated. It's also realistically with, you know, the education budgets and all that. My district would love to give the teachers raises, but they do not have the resources to do that. I think in the long run, this teacher shortage is going to do a lot of good for education because it's people will realize the value that our educators bring to the community and you know the compensation will go up, the supports for them will go up and just just how people view them and their importance I think will, will increase. And so far this effort has shown that given these types of resources, many teachers would remain in schools. I know several young teachers in my district who were thinking about leaving that are not leaving now. And those are three amazing teachers that I'm so glad that my students get to have them as teachers. And part of the reason why is because of the donor. I think it's also, this is my fourth year of teaching, and this is the first year where I'm like, I could do this next year. Like, I'm, I'm gonna be honest. A lot of times I'm like, I don't know if I could be here next year. Even though I love this job, like there is a lot of stress allowing teachers to not only provide for their students, but themselves as well. My students are very well aware of this, but I joined a roller derby team that's in Holland and then started like, I've been more intentional about building friendships and community in Holland. Holland Public Schools says it has funding to keep the program going over the next five years, with hopes other donors will come forward, offering teachers more than houses, belonging in this tight-knit community. I couldn't see a future for myself because I just couldn't see myself living here, like financially. And then when I realized that I could buy a house here, that's when I started to set down roots. Now I'm actually building a life here. And I just, I feel, so, it's funny how much a house does this, but I just feel like this is my place now and I'm secure. And now I'm like actually living my life here. points and labor statistics may show an important snapshot of what's happening in education today, but they leave out an important piece of the puzzle, voices of teachers, the stories and experiences that contribute to these graphs and charts. Today, Mutually Inclusive's Jennifer Moss is in the studio with two of West Michigan's own to talk about life in and out of a classroom. Hello everyone, thanks for joining us now. Uh, today we're talking of course about education and for our part we're taking a look at teachers in the classroom and hearing some of their thoughts about what's happening there. And today we have the pleasure of welcoming Paula Collier, longtime substitute teacher for Grand Rapids Public Schools working at Westwood Middle School mm -hmm. and Michelle Jeske at Hudsonville High School, 23 years in the business there. Thank you both for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you so Good much time. for inviting me. Yes, thanks for the invite. And each of you have your own uh, unique perspective on what's happening in the world of teaching today. I would imagine that you both came into this uh, profession, however you landed here, um, wondering and wanting to know how you could help students, maybe students at the heart of it all. Education, of course, being very important. Um, you wanted to help co the community's children? We'll start with you, Michelle. I, yes, I come from a family of educators. My parents were um, elementary school principals, um, 
for over 30 years. Two of my sisters are teachers. My brother works at Davenport University. So it's in our, it's just in, in our DNA, right? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, uh, I get to hang out with kids every day. And I don't know a, another job where, you know, you plan your Halloween costume and mm -hmm. think about, ooh, comfy day's coming up. I get to wear my, my sweatpants <laughs> to work today. This is great. And, and you know, hanging out with kids, um, helping them learn about whatever the subject is, mm -hmm. like that's, that's what I like. So it's been Absolutely. fun. Wonderful. Absolutely. I too share uh, the same uh, value in working with children because I find that children are so genuine. They just naturally accept who you are and then you have a the opportunity to learn, to share what you have learned. You know, you're producing a, a ne the next generation. Mm -hmm. You're pouring into them, and I just love to do that. And I love to see when the light comes on, and they're being inspired. And that just is, is, it gives me joy. I bet there's nothing like that to see that light bulb moment for the mm -hmm. for our, for the children. So earlier in our show, uh, Kylie Ambu talked about um, some of the statistics: classrooms in America battling a shortage of educators. What's at the heart, in your opinion, of the shortage? Is it a lack of pay? There was COVID, uh, crowded classrooms, parental support. Um, what are some of the things that you're seeing, Paula? We'll start with you on that. Well, I I have really been seeing a lot of behavior issues. Uh, I think since COVID, we have such a new culture that has developed and evolved out of that time when we were all at home and, uh, and just stagnant. It's like we have a I don't care uh, attitude. Uh, sometimes it's, it gets hostile in the classroom and um, uh, kids are unable to read. Teachers just feel like, am I making an impact? I do that daily. I ask myself that question because I have students, we're, we're doing everything from CVC words and uh, sight words. And I even play bingo with words and alphabet, uh, just trying to explore different ways to teach them these words and how to recognize. And it's like there's a gap somewhere. The cognitive uh, impairment is just so obvious and they are just not enthused about learning. They don't care about any discipline. Unfortunately, you don't have a lot of parental support. Um, I call homes, I email, and you just don't have the backing and support that we've had years ago mm -hmm. uh, from parents. In Hudsonville, it's a little bit different in our demographic, but mm -hmm. some of those behavior issues, I know when speaking with our administrators, um, it, it's a challenge. Um, I do think, especially with upper level kids, and I'm sure with middle schoolers too, that phone is a real problem. Mm -hmm. And they are trained to short bursts, and I want to be entertained. And I don't want, just tell me what to do, and I'll mm -hmm. do it. Um, instead of, but what do you think about this? Yes. But I also know that there, you know, this has been a hard time since COVID mm -hmm. for everyone to recover from that. Mm -hmm. We did have a lot of isolation and we do have mental health stressors mm -hmm. and the economy is good for some, but not every family. We are facing some of those similar issues of you call home and mom and dad are working or it's just mom or I wasn't at school because I was taking care of my grandma who has dementia. When I'm feeling burnout, it's a lot of, um, you know, all of the mental work that we're doing every day, the decisions that have to be made on the fly for 30 kids at a time or more um, all day long, it, it's it's a lot. And then, you know, to be asked to, could you please be at this meeting and could you be on this committee and we have this that's gonna be happening and we need you to fill out this paperwork for that. It, it's, uh, we're asked to do a lot without a whole lot of support and that's not the fault of anyone, um, mm -hmm. our administrators, are lacking support. Our superintendents yes. are lacking support. Yes. Our parents are lacking support. We, I don't know if maybe COVID made us all go back to our home bases and then mm -hmm. we've forgotten that we should, we need to, as a community, come together and help uplift each other. I mean, because what are we gonna do if we fall off and don't have the teachers? I mean, they have retention programs where they're trying to bring teachers in, as we mentioned. Um, but what do you see as the future then for gaining uh, more people interested in becoming teachers for this generation and beyond? What I would like to see is more involvement with the community. I would like to see the community engage with the students, academic programs outside of the school building 
into uh, maybe a classroom or working as a protege with someone to tag along and learn what the skill is, expose them to the industry, that way it would spark some interest. Last year, we had some. St I had some speakers come for Black History Month, magistrates and and and, and doctors, and it inspired them. But if they could have took that even a step further and took them on, mm -hmm. you know, I know it's liability issues and a lot to cross before we get to that point. However, if the students could be exposed to the industries, mm -hmm. that might be a possibility to increase the industry. Michelle. So we have a really great career line tech center. Um, in Ottawa County, I know Kent County has a tech center too, where once kids get to high school, they are able to get those career experiences and they're doing phlebotomy, they're doing mm -hmm. cosmetology school. So those kinds of programs I think are really important and we need to make sure that you know people know they exist and that kids are pushed to, not everyone has to go to college, that's okay, right? Mm -hmm. right? Exactly. Um, but you wanna be able to take care of yourself and have a life where, I don't know, you want to go on a vacation every mm -hmm. now and again. Mm -hmm. um, but I think for getting kids to want to be teachers, kids kids are still doing that. It just, I think um, when you get into it, it's that year one, two, three, when you realize, whoa, this is, this is really hard. Mm -hmm. um, a colleague sent me a TikTok last night of a girl who was just crying about, I have to work nine to five. This is really hard. When am I supposed to have friends? I don't even know, like, uh, I don't even get home till six o'clock at night and I don't even want to cook myself dinner. I'm so tired, what is this? And like, yeah. Right. Life, it's yeah. called life. I, it it right. is, it's what it is. Right. And it's, so I think people think that teaching is easy because they've been in classrooms and probably had really good teachers. Mm -hmm. And it's not easy. <laughs> It's a lot of work. We're almost out of time, so and I hate because I want to continue the conversation. Yeah. But so each of you tell me, moving forward in the future, the world of education and and being able to help teachers be the best that they can be, because you do need that support. That's key. Looking at the demographics, which are very different, uh, from Hudsonville to GRPS, mm -hmm. to create sustainability, I believe you have to really zoom in on the family, because the family is so broken since COVID. There's so many broken areas in the families. The community is, is such a large gap with the community and the teachers, and I think it correlates to the, all of it coming back to the school okay. and inspiring students to want to learn, giving them hope. Absolutely, hope there. Um, I think piggybacking on that, the idea of support like it is essential for us, for teachers to support kids, for parents to support staff members mm -hmm. and board members and superintendents. Nearly everyone who gets into education is there to help kids because they really like kids and they want to, they liked school or they want school to be easier or fun or they understand that it's the step to get a better life. Mm -hmm. um, and when I think if people could remember that, that we're not out here indoctrinating anyone. And if we were, it would be to bring your pencil every day. I wouldn't have to, you know, you probably wouldn't have to <laughs> say to middle schoolers, would you please shower and mm. put on deodorant? Because whoa, mm. <laughs> right? right. <laughs> like if, if we were actually indoctrinating people, right. th those things would already be happening. So we're, we're just trying to indoctrinate kids to like be a good person, mm -hmm. do the best you can, try to help other people, um, and then learn some content along the way so that you can be a better person. It's as kind of get full circle. Like yeah. everyone helps each person and then it comes yeah. right it's back to the beginning. I tell, I tell my students that all the time. I'm not smarter than you. I'm just further ahead That's than it. you are. I'm not, I, I just like, I know these things are gonna happen because I watched them happen back there. You just haven't seen it yet. And so we're all in this together. We're all together at this unique time on this planet, this unique group of people. Like, can we just, let's just help. It's all, it's hard for everybody. Let's just all help right. each other right. as much as we can. Family togetherness, support, those are key things you all are saying we need community. and encouragement and yeah. community. Thank you both for taking time for being here today. I appreciate it. You are Thank very you. welcome. Thank you. Thank for you for me. inviting me. These teaching shortages aren't hitting all learners the same. Despite special education teachers serving a critical role in public schools, the U.S. Department of Education says 45% of schools reported vacancies in special education roles during 2022, leaving learners with inadequate resources. When it comes to staff diversity, numbers are also low. With the majority of students in the U.S. being of color, a report by the Education Trust shows only about 20% of teachers are of color. 
Research has proven that teacher diversity benefits all students, regardless of race or ethnicity. And it also has additional impacts on representation. Let's take a look at what Grand Valley State University is doing to build up this workforce. Michigan is battling a teacher shortage that's rocked the entire nation. And it's seen from many angles. While schools struggle to fill classrooms with educators, colleges and universities are also seeing numbers of education majors dwindle. Grand Valley State University is actually the largest teacher certification program in the state of Michigan. But as many retention programs are focused on how to keep teachers in the classroom, Grand Valley State University says this short supply of educators can't help but be intertwined with the historic shortage of teacher diversity. I had a different vision about what my role would be here, and I kind of just dug down and did a little research, and two of the key areas that I, I found that were of importance was really the issue around teacher recruitment and retention. The power of representation extends far beyond emotions. While data shows teacher diversity can improve math and reading scores among all students, research consistently demonstrates that students' academic achievements are elevated when they're taught by educators who mirror their cultural or racial backgrounds. There's some great research that's been done uh, across the country that look at the impact, especially around young uh, male learners of color and how the retention and graduation rates for high school is quite a bit higher, but then the probability of them going on to higher ed is much higher. Despite this, educator diversity is a shortage that's plagued Michigan schools for years, with 2023 data showing white teachers make up more than 89% of the state's overall teaching population. And educators of color who do enter the field are two to three times more likely to be placed in high poverty urban public schools with the most challenging yet under-resourced working conditions. A 2018 study says this might impact the 19% of educators of color who leave their school or professions compared to the 15% of their white colleagues. Then of course, there's financial barriers. What we found is people realize later that they don't have the financial capacity to do so. So speaking as a first-gen college attendee, you know, my parents are immigrants, that's not the profession that probably I was pushed towards, right? You're, you're looking towards a career. If you're going to make the choice to go into higher ed, there's something that's going to generate a little higher income. That is a barrier. So how do we grow the pool of diverse talent in the classroom? Grain Valley State University says it starts with asking what we can do to support pre-service educators of color. Are these the areas that really, really need to address? Um, are these the things that pre-service students who are serving here in the college want to receive this opportunity? And is this something that will help leverage them during their academic career as well as as they enter the profession? On top of local programs like Grow Your Own, which provides opportunities for people to go back to school, GVSU dove into the heart of its student-teacher population. I transferred from GRCC and there was like from going to this like very like diverse kind of population from like ages to races to just like everything and then coming to GVSU was like a very drastic shift. So in my first semester um, I felt very like isolated at the beginning because I was like wow like where is everyone? Yasmin Alamayu is a member of GVSU's education program and throughout her studies became one of the founding student members of the school's Educators of Color Network. When it was like the first time at GVSU where I was like, wow, I see like people of color and I like see myself in this environment. And it had like professors, like students from the variations of the education program. Started by the GVSU College for Education and Community Innovation, the Educators of Color Network serves as a support group, sounding board, networking opportunity, and more for pre-service teachers. And those conversations would consist of like, what does it feel like, like going to a PWI? And then what does it feel like going into a field where you won't particularly always see yourself? Having students get a break during Ramadan because they're fasting the whole month, right? Those conversations aren't usually had because people of color weren't a part of those conversations. Applying it to like my real life experiences has been like an eye opener for me because I realized people are willing to listen 
just no one gave them the space to learn about it. This group may serve as the first time members have felt represented in the education space, not only as future teachers, but students as well. I have never had a teacher of color until 10th grade, um, Mr. Bannister, which I think his first, that first experience of having a teacher of color was like, oh wow, like, I, oh, I can do this. For Alamayu, this group offers more than camaraderie and empathy. It instills a sense of belonging within the education community. I don't believe I would be the educator I am today without that group. And I don't think I would be as loud in my advocacy for our students of color without that group. It taught me the purpose of being able to be loud with your stories and being able to share them in a way where people understand and can learn from them. Now working as a teacher herself, she feels the impact of her presence every day in the classroom. I've never had a hijabi teacher, which is like pretty obvious, but like I feel like it should be like vocalized, like there's no hijabi teachers. I remember my first year working there, like the students, especially the hijabis, were like, what are you doing here? Like, like are you here because like my mom sent you? It was like eye-opening, like what if I did have that hijabi teacher? Would like, would I ever, would I question myself as much? Would I have like struggled my way through a school? As she pushes the needle forward for others, it creates a chain reaction of support within the network, giving tomorrow's teachers the support to help them thrive today and into the future. Educators of color coming together and collaborating and be a part of a community that is able to like reassure you, like say like, yeah, like it, it's hard, don't, don't get me wrong, but you're, it's worth you being here and it's worth the struggle of being here. As long as they are willing to put in the effort and be willing to be like confidently themselves, they deserve to be in that space. You know, today was very interesting. We covered many facets of education, everything from teacher retention, you know, the uh, idea of being able to potentially have a home, um, funding for teachers, giving them additional salaries as incentives to bring them in to the discussion from the teachers themselves, looking at, you know, what it's like to be a teacher today, some of the issues that they're facing, and, you know, still having that heart for mm -hmm. the students right there in the forefront. And I think that's key as they move forward and, and deal with some of the things that, that are happening on the daily in their classrooms. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what we saw today was different experiences. I mean, we talked with mm -hmm. teachers who serve different populations in different areas here in West Michigan. Absolutely. And everyone will have their own unique experience in the classroom. From what we've talked about today, we know educators of color may have different experiences. If you don't come from a you know heavy economic background, something like the Teachers Live Here program from Holland would be life-changing. But I love what you said. They, it all seems to kind of come together in unity that they have this passion for kids. They have a passion for learning and that's why they get into this field. And that's where they're talking about family, uh, community, all of that involvement coming together mm -hmm. to kind of perpetuate um, you know, this, like you said, unity yes. so that they can move forward in a positive direction. And of course, if you want to continue learning with us today, we've got resources on our screen and you can find this episode along with many others on our website. There is still more to come, so be sure to follow WGVU on Facebook and YouTube for the latest on upcoming episodes. We're of course excited to see you next Wednesday, so thanks for helping us be mutually inclusive.